I was reviewing a paper, an anonymous paper, which kind of blew me away because it suggested that this surgical periodontist out in California had devised an approach to managing this potentially vulnerable posterior zone ever so successfully. And of course, it was Odette Bahat. Odette, you're very welcome here, and we're looking forward to your presentation. When I was asked by Dr. Zob to cover this subject, it became very clear to me that my goals of intraoral aesthetic and therefore facial aesthetics have not changed. What has changed is the hardware. There are substantial changes with techniques. They've been modified and augmented. And there's a large change within the dental community as far as divergence of goals of treatment. And therefore, what I will discuss with you today are what are the objectives and how do we reconcile them. Let's look at some of the previous surgical and prosthetic component, and it's for me pretty amazing to think that in the 70s, the results that have been achieved in Gothenburg are actually unique when you're going to see it, those rudimentary elements. We look at some goals of the restorative dentist, the dentist, and the patients, and how do we execute it. I will cover quite extensively what constitutes aging, not just biologically, but facially, as well as discuss with you the changes of extraoral and intraoral aesthetics. And finally, we will be talking about how do I plan the surgical execution. So what do we try to reconcile? The surgeon looks always for optimal anchorage. That means he looks for bone. The restorative dentist or the prostodontist looks for ideal location and sometimes not often for aesthetics. We have incompatible hardware. It's mechanical, used to be. Today we have some aesthetic components. And let me make it very clear in advance that all my biases that are not supported by those seven or eight papers will be from now on delineated in orange. So these are my views. And it's commonly said that the patient wants quick treatment and inexpensive. It is true. But my experience is that patients want always aesthetic results. I've never seen in my office, and it's not unique, that a patient will come in at age 40 and ask to look like 60. That doesn't happen, ladies and gentlemen. So we have to start thinking. Surgery reconstruction is my bias, and it's the way I'll always go. And it's hard for me to believe in medicine that somebody who is an amputee will be suggested that continue his life as an amputee. It will always suggest it to reconstruct. However, in some fields I hear today that one way to get the patient to walk straight is amputate the other leg. That's commonly done in our profession. And let's talk a little bit about craniofacial growth. It is interesting to me that despite a tremendous body of literature and very good clinical studies, it didn't gain too much traction in our field. Now let's look at one of those patients that operated in 1993. At the time, Nobel had only two types of implants, were 375 and 4 millimeter, and they came up with a narrow 3.25. That was, they didn't even have the correct armatorium to instrument. Now pay attention to the distance from the apical part of the central to the apical part of the implant, taking into account that the distance from the apical part of the implant to the flow of the nose is constant. We operated her, and that's the way she looked in 2010. Compare the distance from the apex of the tooth to the apex of the implant, and look at the migration of the two centrals, which are dental unit, compared to the laterals, which are the implant that are ankylosed and impede growth. Let's look a little bit about facial aging. Let's look at a little bit of actual oral aesthetics. There are many, many references regarding that. I won't bore you with that, but the conclusions are the following. Our eye acts very much like a very sophisticated lens. 
it picks up convexities, it picks up angles. Those convexities, while it hits by light, allows us to detect texture, allows us to detect distances and figures. The seven highlights are always elliptical in nature. You can look at them as Fabergé eggs. They're always covered with skin and underlying fat and bone. And as all you know, with aging, we lose fat and bone. These are the seven highlights. They are the brow, the eye, the cheek, the two lips, the jaw, and the chin. They reflect light and shadows and give us the ability to detect what is beautiful, what is less attractive, what is aged. There are seven angles, and they are the bra angle, which is from mid decanthus to the junction of two thirds of the eyebrow to the outer third. The eye angle from mid decanthus to the lateral decanthus, the cheek, the lips, the jaw angle, and the neck. This will dictate what the eye perceives as beautiful, attractive, unattractive, or age phase. Now, how do I reconcile then my surgical protocol to the previous surgical protocol and my aesthetic demands? One, placement is governed only by healthy anatomy and optimal intraoral and aesthetic. Two, I'll perform <coughs> surgical reconstruction, and we'll need to do much more of that with craniofacial growth. I'll perform that whenever I can or need it. You have to <coughs> consider the mode of provisionalization in the reconstructed area. Ostectomy will be determined by ideal aesthetics, not by available bone. If the bone is not there, provide it. I'll use anatomical hardware, and please consider craniofacial growth. And I will definitely avoid any procedures that are not supported by well-designed and well-documented studies. We published that <coughs> series of three papers. You have the synopsis on your chairs. <coughs> when what was expected from us is three-dimensional reconstruction, so it's not just, as mentioned this morning, vertical augmentation, but vertical, horizontal augmentation with Bob Fontanes in a series of three papers in 2001. I agree that in any of these type of reconstruction, you have the inherent risk of failure. There were 67 patients, 289 implants, and all received ceramometal reconstruction. So it is, for me, very important that when we measure success, we don't just measure survival of the implants. And unfortunately, in our profession, there are very few papers that measure success, for example, as a pink aesthetic uh, score. Controlled tissue expansion in which we'll place an <clears throat> expander device. We published that in the late 80s. We stretch the tissue, keep on stretching it until I have adequate amount of tissue. We remove the expander, place whatever bone graft material that you like. For me, in large reconstructed area, it's always cortical cancerous graft, and then advance it and close it. The other method, which is much more common, is an anterior advanced flap, which consists of two parallel incisions, two back-cut incisions, and this has to reach the edge flap without any tension. One of the most common mistakes is stretching the flap over a large reconstruction, and I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that your patient will complain on the color of the tissue. And as we saw this morning, there were attempts to alter the tissue by adding gingiva. There's a technically much better approach, and that is put soft tissue already during your surgery over the bone graft or enhance the tissue prior to surgery. And that is because once you stretch the tissue, it's very similar to stretching a balloon. If you have a balloon of the same physical property, the same volume, once you stretch it, the color will change. It still may be gingiva, but it's not going to be red and not pink. So augment tissue always when you reconstruct with a large bone graft. The way we perform that, the area is exposed. The tissue is already thickened. I dissect the internal part of the flap. Dissect it until there's no tension. 
Then I have double flap, the inside and the outside. We measure it exactly like a tailor will measure any pattern. So now we have the internal of part of the flap that will reach the edge flap. We'll suture it. And then they advance the outside part of the flap to reach the destination. Will that allow you then is to get a much better color match so you don't have the inflated balloon and will allow you much less shallowing in the vestibule and the need for second and third procedure. Now let's take this advanced case. The area is reconstructed and I'm building it well away from the blood supply. It's contained with a mesh and the ridge is reconstruct reconstructed seven months later. What happens to the face? Well, remember we talked about facial aesthetics and what, con <coughs> what constitute those elliptical shapes, Fabergé eggs. This is the starting point. This is the upper lip ending point. That's without Restylane and without the dermatologist and without the plastic surgeon. They're certainly not going to provide a patient bone. These are the changes within the lower lip and the upper lip. When you look at the anterior view, as far as tissue volume that is restored through this reconstruction, let's put them apart. We have a 60% increase in volume of the upper lip, and that's permanent. It doesn't go away every six months. The, <coughs> the lip angle is 30 degrees and change to 42 degrees. Thank you very much.